on camera. Okay, today is September the 15th, 2015. My name is Roger Soyset. I'm here with Sue Verhoff uh, at the apartment of uh, Gordon Powell. Uh, we work for the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, where we are, I'm volunteer. Sue's actually works there. Uh, we're here to discuss with Mr. Powell his experiences in World War II. Uh, he was in, in the Army. Uh, this interview is being recorded for the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. Uh, and as a representative of the Atlanta Vietnam Veterans Business Association, I'd like to throw in a little plug for that organization. Uh, Mr. Powell, would you please give us your full name and current address and start off maybe with where you were born. All right. My full name is Gordon Stanley Powell. I was named Stanley because my father's name is Gordon S. Powell and I'd be Gordon S. Powell and they didn't want a junior <laughs> or a little Gordon and a big Gordon. My mother's name was Stanley so that's where I get the middle name. I was born in Atco, Georgia which is a little village just north or just very adjacent to Cartersville, Georgia. It was a village built by the American Textile Company with a mill and a village for manufacturing fabric for tires. Goodyear bought them out and the name of the place is the acronym of American Textile Company, ATCO. Hmm. And my father jokingly says that they must have bought me with it because I never left my desk and just what started being paid by the new ownership. I lived for about uh, se oh, better part of seven years in, in the little community of Atco, and then my dad was transferred to Rockmart, Georgia, after uh, the American Textile Company had sold out to Goodyear. And there are three textile plants in the area, Cartersville, or Atco that is, Rockmart and Gadsden, Alabama, and he was sent to Rockmart to be the uh, office manager of the, of the Rockmart plant. That's where I grew up from second grade through high school. Rockmart is a great little city to have grown up in, and uh, I was there. Uh, I entered Georgia Tech while I was still uh, at in Rockmart. We getting close now to my. Uh, getting into the military service. I had fully intended to be a graduate of Georgia Tech and as an electrical engineer and uh, science and that sort of thing were always easy for me and pleasurable to me and uh, that, was, that was my intent. However, in the fall of my freshman year, the Dean of Students at Tech got all of the new students together and suggested very strongly, and it was sounded like a wonderful idea, join the enlisted reserve corps, then the draft can't touch you, and you can probably finish your education because the draft can't get you, and you can then go into service in some area related to your major study. What sounded, what could have sounded any better than that? So we all did, and believe me, you probably already know this, but uh, some four or five million bo college boys did that around that same time. And uh, the uh, whole uh, utopian idea was sort of blown apart by the fact that the uh, Pentagon suddenly realized, see, we know that D-Day is, is on the books, we don't know when, but we're going to need a lot of gun fodder for that. Let's just activate the entire enlisted reserve corps and put them in the army. <laughs> That's what they did. I enlisted in November of uh, 42, was ordered to active service de uh, March 31st, 43. I assume there was some little asterisk there within your agreement on going into the reserves that this could be done, but... Well, I, I presume so. <laughs> it's part of the fine print that yeah. people never reads. But uh, at any rate, I was ordered to service as of March 31st, 43, I reported to... Uh, uh, Fort McPherson in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. From there I was sent to Fort Eustis, Virginia for my basic training. Fort Eustis was an anti-aircraft artillery uh, training place. 
it was very near to Williamsburg in location, right on the James River. Mm -hmm. So 13 weeks of that, and then they allowed uh, we college boys in many instances, and I was one of them, to go back to school via the ASTP, Army Specialized Training Program. I'm sure you've probably interviewed others who had the same experience. So I was sent then to the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. I'm guessing this training didn't have anything to do with Catholicism, though. I'm sorry? The training, was it religious training? No, no. <laughs> Catholic U was, uh, it was certainly a religious school, but it, it, was, it had the us usual university uh, academics. Yeah. And I was in a pre-engineering uh, field. But then the Army got a little nervous with having sent these GIs to school again. They, 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 they knew better when D-Day was probably going to take place, so they just deactivated the Army Specialized Training Program completely. And I was shipped to, Fort, uh, to uh, Camp Swift, Texas for, ma this? for training in the, in the 102nd Infantry Division. Where is Camp Swift? Camp Swift is near Austin, okay. near where the University of Texas is. Okay. On a weekend pass, I could go into Austin easily. So I was there for the time it took to get us trained for combat. From there, we were shipped to Fort Dix, New Jersey, where we stayed for a bit of a further uh, training, I guess, for our ultimate trip overseas and whatever followed that. And I was a musician all my life and I was so glad to have opportunities on weekends to go into New York. I loved the, the symphonies and that sort of thing, so my trips to New York would be uh, to uh, be there in time to go first of all to uh, Radio City Music, well not Radio City, but the uh, Studio A8, 8H, which was the one where the NBC Orchestra with Toscanini performed every Sunday afternoon. Mm. And it was early enough that I could hear that, and then I would run down the street to Carnegie Hall and hear the New York Philharmonic, and then I'd get on the train to go back to Fort Dix. I was a violin student. I loved music. I, uh, Never expected to do anything with it professionally, mm -hmm. but uh, I'll tell you more about that as this uh, interview goes on. I should uh, ask, what was your specialty? What you know, Well, I grew up playing the violin. Well, in the military, yeah. in the Army. I'm sorry? What was your function in the Army? Well, my function in the Army was a member of an anti-tank company. Okay. And... Uh, We, let me tell you how we, uh, first of all, uh, we, uh, I was in the anti-tank company from the time I went into uh, uh, Camp Swift. Mm -hmm. And in that phase of the infantry, it was in the 406 Infantry Regiment. And uh, none of this had anything to do with my musical, musical background, <laughs> but uh, at any rate, uh, the old expression, needs of the service. Beg pardon? Needs of the service. Yes. <laughs> uh, from uh, Camp from Fort Dix, once they, we were uh, tr uh, outfitted and processed properly, we uh, shipped out for uh, overseas. And it's interesting, we left New York Harbor on 9-11-43. Forty-four, I guess it was. Forty-three. Forty-three. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Pardon me, I have to bring these numbers back <laughs> carefully, or I might miss one. And uh, nobody would, of course, known that uh, fifty-seven years, sixty-seven years later, it would become one of the most infamous dates in American history. But at I, any rate, maybe I made a mistake there. You uh, did you arrive after D-Day or before? Before. Before. Okay. Before. So yeah. Forty-three. 43. Okay. Uh, we uh, were in a, one of the largest convoys between New York and our port of departure mm -hmm. that ever shipped. 
uh, I think it took us three weeks to cross the Atlantic because we kept zigzagging all the way because the mm -hmm. German U-boats were very prolific in those areas. They never got any of us because our uh, uh, destroyers that, that completely surrounded our uh, convoy uh, kept them away. But we landed in Cherbourg Harbor, first, any, first troops to ever get into Cherbourg since uh, D-Day. And uh, speaking of D-Day, we were on a uh, problem, a, 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 we call them problems, uh, the training problems in, in Camp Swift mm -hmm. on the, the day of the invasion. And they stopped everything and called us together and had us sit down and says, we just want you to know that, that the troops invaded Europe this morning. On, on this date, and so far everything's good, it, but they are having a terrible struggle uh, against oh the, the steep cliffs and the the uh, defense and that sort of thing. And I might say parenthetically right here that if Hitler had been willing to let his own generals handle the whole thing, we would have had a much much worse time. Yeah. He was egotistical enough to think he could outthink the generals, and he couldn't. But thank goodness he was egotistical because some of us are alive today because he was. At any rate, uh, we landed in Cherbourg and we went from there to the hedgerow country, which you may have heard of. It's in the Normandy Peninsula, mm -hmm. sticks out into the English Channel. It's a beautiful area, but it rains every day because of its intrusion into the uh, waters there, into the channel. When we got into our hedgerow place for our unit, it was beautiful grass. Very shortly thereafter, it was a loblolly because trucks and everything was in there. We had to find, we, mm -hmm. fortunately, we got to pitch our pup tents before they tore up the ground completely. Otherwise, we would have been <laughs> in mud instead of a, at least a grassy spot. But we were there uh, getting final preparations for going into combat. But while we were there, those of us who could drive a truck were detached temporarily to drive in the Red Ball Express. The Red Ball Express was created to keep General Patton's forces supplied with gasoline and other supplies because he had broken free after Paris was liberated and was making as much as 50 miles a day in, in his, his advances. And the higher-ups knew full well that could not continue without plenty of supplies coming because the Germans had cut them off and then he, they would be in the worst kind of situation. So I was one of those who drove the truck and I had one partner with me one of us was driving while the other slept, and it was constant. We loaded our gasoline cans at, at uh, Omaha Beach, where they were brought in by ship. We carried 305 five-gallon cans of gas in, that, in the back of that truck. It was, had high side rails, fortunately, but we had to use ropes and so forth across the back of the truck to keep the things from falling out. And it's a wonder it did, they didn't happen anyway. But we would drive from Omaha Beach to the parish rail yards, unload, and then go back to Omaha for the next load. And it was round and round and round it went until the, the Red Ball Express was declared not any longer necessary. It had provided the uh, frequency of supplies going to Patton that he needed, and the Germans couldn't uh, do him any damage because they were too well supplied, and they, if they had tried to cut them off, they'd only been forced back. Was there any risk, I'm sure there was risk, but was there any incidents of ambush, uh, Germans uh, trying to take out these uh, trucks that are making the At ride? that point in time, the Germans didn't have that kind of power to do that. They, were, they had been pretty well decimated. By the time okay. Paris was taken, Half of France was already liberated, and the heart of France, namely Paris, was uh, free. Okay. And uh, 
I'm just wondering so, about security. You so know, far they, as I we know, we always had convoy escorts. Did so you far as escorts? I know, we never had any any of the, our drivers had any incidents at okay. all. Okay. Our worst fear was, was uh, going to sleep at the wheel, because all of that constant driving, yeah. sleep while you're not driving, is. <laughs> It, it's rambunctious sleep at the best. I mean, you, you bounced along in these ro country roads, then I might explain what the red ball, how it was defined. The, tr the path that we took from the beach to Paris was uh, noted by signs on the posts, trees, whatever, a big red ball painted on a piece of car uh, plywood or whatever. And we just followed those signs, and where there was a, a, a juncture of any sort, an arrow would point the way you tur turned. And it was very effective, and as far as I know, nobody got lost, and I don't recall any stories where any trucks turned over, although I can't imagine how we got through some of those places without that. And uh, once that uh, was considered a successful and completed effort, we went back to our regular uh, divisions mm -hmm. and units. From there, from we, when I returned back, we were just about ready to go to the front. And when we were ready, we rode to the front on European uh, boxcars. They were called mm -hmm. 40 and 8s. 40, they would, they would uh, so named because they could take 40 men or eight horses. And if you wanted to sleep, you started to try to inch down into a sleeping position by two or three o'clock in the afternoon, or else you'd stand up and sleep, because there was no uh, no provision for anything more than just space to carry you to the to the front. But we got there, and it was not far in time before the. In fact, it was almost just before the Germans attacked at uh, Bastogne and created mm -hmm. the B Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. Now we were involved in that, but only in a peripheral way. Somehow, luckily, our division, the 102nd Infantry Division, was told to hold the entire Ninth Army front while the others went down into the battle. Well, we, we had GIs as much as 50 yards apart in foxholes. We couldn't have stopped an army of ants, really, but the Germans <laughs> didn't choose to make any further attacks except down at the Bulge. And there's one reason, one thing about that whole thing that I will never understand. The Germans knew so much that we, about us that, they could, that we could get their pa our passwords from the Germans. Hmm. But somehow they never connected the fact that just west of our location on the north flank was Liège, Belgium. And Liège was the gasoline depot for, depot for the entire military, Allied military forces. Why they didn't come th ch charging through there, I'll never know, because what stopped the Battle of the Bulls mostly was them running out of gas. Mm. But we had a plan. If they had come, we were told Take off down the little highways as hard, fast as you can, you know, going away from them. Every little country road was a tree-lined road, and every tree had a pack of dynamite on it. And all of the fields between those roads were heavily mined, so that if the Germans had come after us, we could have pretty well slowed them down, if not stopped them, by the mines stopping their uh, armor. And as soon as our vehicles would get down that road, those trees would be blown and they'd fall across the road, forcing the armor into the fields. So uh, that would have worked, but it never had to. Somehow the Germans never picked up on the fact that if they'd gone to Liège, they might have gone all the way to Paris. But nevertheless, they didn't, and thank God. I wonder if there was a plan to destroy that depot of uh, gasoline. Well, they didn't have the Air Force to do it. Well, I mean by us, if, to oh. prevent them from getting it. Oh, well, if they had done that, we would have, but it would have been a great loss because yeah. it would have been destroyed our supplies as well as theirs. Yeah. So we, we were lucky in that respect. Mm -hmm. Now, history that knows more of the facts 
than I've ever learned <clears throat> might differ with some of what I'm telling you, but that's the way we saw it. And we were thankful that uh, it, ne it never took place that the Germans would realize mm -hmm. the gold mine that they had just a few miles away, Liège being directly west of our northern flank. Uh, you, uh, we were the, in the, the Ninth Army, and the American forces were in the center of the broad attack. We were on the north flank of the American forces, and we were next to the, next to the British. The other American divisions and so forth were south of us, and then the French were on the south edge of the uh, entire United Front going attacking into Germany. <clears throat> so uh, I'm losing my train of thought here, excuse me. At any rate, uh, once, the ba once the bulge was done away with, thanks to uh, they, them running out of gas and us being able to repulse their worst efforts at taking charge, uh, then we got back into the business of trying to chase the Germans instead of them coming after us. <laughs> we. Uh, We, we engaged the Germans all along in one place or another, mostly small towns. Our tanks would uh, be a, at the spearhead of what the uh, whole army activity was. The, the troops followed the tanks and were intermingled with them, but the tanks could uh, sort of prepare the way. But it was always tragic to see after a battle had been won and we went on before, went on beyond, the number of tanks, of our tanks that had been knocked out. And undoubtedly they represented any number of GIs that were killed. But that's, that's combat. And slowly we worked our way across Germany and met the Russians at the Elbe River and met the, and ended the war. And the German army surrendered to the 102nd Division to get, get to the Americans before the Russians got to them, yeah. because they did not want the Russians to have anything to yeah. any any over in overpowering of them. They'd much rather surrender to us. They knew they'd get at least humane treatment. How friendly was the greeting between the Americans and the Russians? We didn't en encounter a whole lot of uh, contact with them, except uh, well, certainly after v after VE Day when we met the Russians yeah. at the river. But uh, there begins the end of the, I mean, the end of the war in Europe, and we were expected to stay there and occupy the the area until we were redeployed to the South Pacific, which, thanks to the atomic bomb, never yeah. had to happen. But uh, as our division commander attended celebrations that the Russians put on. I mean, both armies just celebrated with each other, you wouldn't believe. Our division commander went to a Russian party at which a Russian army chorus was the entertainment. And our division commander, Frank A. Keating, knew full well that we were going to be uh, hurting for entertainment while we were doing nothing but guard duty eight hours on and 16 off every day. And if we could provi help, prov help the USO provide entertainment, that would be a plus. So he decided, heck, I've got a command, I've got a lieutenant, or yeah, no, a, a, a captain in one of my field artillery battalions who in private life is a fine musician. I'm going to call him in and tell him he's going to form and direct a chorus, and we're going to entertain troops while we do that. And uh, That'll be one way that they'll be active and we'll entertain mm -hmm. people that won't get entertainment otherwise and it'll be a good way to pass the time, you know. So he called this captain in, gave him his orders, as I have ordered every GI in this division whose records show training in or interest in music to come to his regimental headquarters company on, the, on a specific date, and these are the dates. You meet with these people because they're there because they're ordered to be there, but hopefully they're going to enjoy 
have a chance to sing rather than do guard duty. And of course, that was the case. I was lucky enough to be one of the 60 or 70 guys chosen to be in the chorus. Was there a sort of a thousand or more that, for those spots? I'm sorry? Was there a competition for these spots? No, there weren't a comp if there, if The only competition was in the mind of the the captain who was selecting the group. Ah, okay. It wasn't, we didn't get together and compete. Nobody would have known what to do. We <laughs> needed a chorus to be able to, so uh, at any rate, it worked out. Uh, we, I was lucky enough to be chosen to be in the chorus. We were ordered to be, to transfer ourselves directly to the division headquarters company. And when we got there, the general met us, told us what our job was going to be, that we were going to do anything in the world but sing and rehearse. <laughs> and he'd see that we covered as much territory as, as we could. And uh, we rehearsed for one week. And the general heard us. He was overwhelmed with, with pleasure as, at his choice to do this because it was going to be a real success as he saw it. From there, we, we uh, did this sort of thing. We entertained troops. We uh, spent two weeks at the Riviera, which was the GI's R&R. &R. We sang twice a day in a, in a show that was created in one of the theaters for entertainment to the troops on R&R. &R. And of course, we had no other duties that during that time. That was probably the one two-week period of time, which was the most fun of all. And uh, one of the things that happened while we were there, the mayor of Nice, we were at Nice, France. GI's R&R uh, &R was at Nice. Bill, uh, uh, commissioned officers and so forth, they were at Cannes for their R&R. &R. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, the mayor of Nice heard us sing at one of our shows and came to our, uh, our conductor, our captain, and asked if we would be willing to do a concert for the civilians. And they had, <clears throat> in Nice, and Nice, by the way, was not affected uh, uh, destruction-wise by the war. It was too far removed. They had a beautiful little opera house. It was sort of a miniature La Scala. High, rounded, boxes, many elevations thereof, and uh, when we walked into that place, the, the civilians, by the way, only had to pay what the uh, law required as a tax on a ticket. I don't know what it was, only a few francs, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But when we walked on stage, I've, ne <laughs> I've never seen a place as packed tightly as that was. There wasn't room for another soul. <clears throat> and they applauded us as we walked on. <laughs> of course, they were still reeling from the fact that they had been liberated by the right. Americans. And we could do no wrong, really. <clears throat> we could, but they didn't see it. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, we did two things right there as we started that concert. First of all, we not only sang our national anthem, but we sang La Marseillaise as well. Mm -hmm. And I really thought that some of those people were going to jump out of the balconies. They were so excited. <laughs> Secondly, I assume well, that would have been a banned song for the German <laughs> occupation. Big pardon? It was probably banned during the occupation. It may have been, I don't know, but yeah. the war had decimated arts in those areas, and so this was the first time they'd heard anything. Yeah like that, one of our singers knew enough pidgin French and had no inhibitions whatsoever. He would walk out and, in, and introduce in French as best he could what we were going to sing. And he would get as much applause as we would. <laughs> <laughs> I later became, because of all this experience, I will jump forward right here to say, uh, there is no uh, feeling that a performing musician gets any better than realizing that the audience is 100% with you. Mm. And I've never had that feeling, feeling more prominently than I did in that situation. 
if I if I talk with a little bit of uh, emotion, I'm sorry, but that's the yeah. way it is. Yeah. But uh, when when he would announce, he would get as much applause as we did, <laughs> and we sang our full concert, and it was the most memorable one thing we did while we were involved in this Do course. Do you recall what other songs he did beside the... We the had to, the music we got, we we would find one or two copies and everybody would sit down and copy his voice part only. And we'd have, that was our music. My music was all bass voice lines. But when we rehearsed, we we were musicians enough that we knew how to relate that to the other voices, and and he, our conductor was good enough to get a good blend, and it worked out very well. But we didn't have any printed music with us. The printed music would be like one or two copies that we found somewhere <laughs> that we used to copy our own parts. But this really worked out. Everybody was one hundred percent with with this and. We thoroughly enjoyed these. We were doing this for about seven months. By the end of seven months, every GI in the chorus had enough points. If you know what I mean by points, that's the way we were able to come home. Hmm. Points meant length of time in service, length of time in combat and overseas, awards, anything. They all accumulated points. And when everybody in the chorus had more than enough to come home, we were uh, ready to dis to disband. One for interesting thing that happened: we found out later that the the army had intended to bring us home as a unit and tour the Amer United States in the oh. war bond drive. But it never happened. The reason being that somehow the orders never quite got followed through with in such a way that we just gave up on it. We decided, no, they're not going to do it. We just, mm -hmm. we just going to leave it, take advantage of the fact we can come home and come home. And that we did. But this, uh, my background musically as a kid was all violin, but I never had a really fine teacher. I grew up in a small town of Rockmart, as I told you. Nobody was around that knew all of the technical fundamentals of how to teach the violin. I think I would have been a professional violinist today if I'd had that kind of training, but I didn't. But the ones who taught me what they could, I'm grateful for. And I've played ever since then, until I've gotten to the point where I really can't anymore because of hearing problems and so forth. But uh, at any rate, uh, When I got home, my home church in Rockmart, they didn't ask me, they told me that I'm going to be their choir director. <laughs> and I said, I've never done that before in my life. They says, well, you know more about this than any of us does. You're going to do it, and we'll be glad to support you any way we can. So I said, all right, I'll give it a try. Mm -hmm. And I submit to you, I never had more fun in my life. <laughs> My How father, long? my father was in the choir, <laughs> and I was auda audacious enough to stand out in front of them and direct them. My mother was very upset with that. She said, he, <laughs> "You're showing off," and, and my father immediately jumped in and says, "No, he's not. We need that kind of leadership. Now you leave him alone." <laughs> and she did. <laughs> and uh, from that, uh, for that three or four months after getting out of service in March until I could go back to Georgia Tech, I led that choir. And in the summer, I, I continued to leave it even though I had gone to summer school at Tech, which was not very demanding. It was just one or two math courses that I wanted to take to get back in the field of engineering and math and so forth, which I was fairly good at. But uh, I would come home on Friday after my last class in summer school, the choir would meet me in the church that evening. They'd have a Friday night re rehearsal. I would lead the choir on Sunday morning, and then I'd head back to Tech that evening, that afternoon. 
Well, when the fall, when the summer session was over and it was time for the fall uh, full-time program of education at Tech to start, I had to tell them that I can't do this anymore. I, it's going to be too taxing. I, I'm, what I'm going to have to do for studying is going to be too requ much requirement. So they understood. And I, as the fall came and I went back in the fall to Tech, I joined the First Baptist Church Choir because it, by, at that year, that choir was better than the Tech Glee Club. The co director of that choir and his wife were both graduates of the Westminster Choir College in Princeton, New Jersey, and excellent musicians. They had a wonderful graded choir program, which means the ch choirs were graded by age, from youngest up to adult, through adults. Mm -hmm. And he was a good conductor, and it was a fine program, and it was a, really the model for church music in Atlanta at the time. And during the course of that year, the director of the new of the Westminster Choir, who was a good friend of his, since he was in about the second class or, or third class of the of the school that after it was started, called him one day and says, I we, the choir is on tour in the South. We're in a church in Alabama where we're going to sing a concert on, a, on a, this coming Sunday afternoon, and we're coming to Atlanta to spend the night in a hotel that's not far from your church. I think it was the Georgian Terrace, as a matter of fact, which is not far from where First Baptist Church used to be. Would you like for me to bring the choir over and sing after church, to sing a few numbers just to let people see, hear us, and we'd like to do it? Oh, of course, he jumped at the chance, and we in the choir jumped at the chance to hear him. And I thought I was in a fairly good chorus in the Army, and I thought to myself, I'm going to hear these people, because I, I know our director here at the church is a fine musician, and if he says it's good, it's got to be good. Well, it was. I'd never heard a choral organization in my life to equal it. The touring choir was 40 voices almost equally balanced 10, 10, 10, and 10 for soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. Mm -hmm. And I mean, balance was perfect. It was a, 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 one of the better choirs that I'm sure had ever existed there because most of the tenors and basses were like me. They had been GIs and they were older. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the male voices are at their best at, at five or six years older than college. And uh, when I heard them, and they'd had the experience of doing this little job in, in, car, in Rock Mart, and had said to my dad in the process, you know, I'd enjoy doing this the rest of my life. He says, well, where would you go to study? And I said, I have no earthly idea. He says, we'll do it as a hobby or an avocation and go on and finish tech, which I expected to do. But as I sat and listened to that choir, mm. I'm sure it was God's voice that came into my head and said, that's your calling in life. You go there to school. I'm sure as I'm sitting here that that happened just as I said it did. So I pulled up stakes from Tech and the following fall I entered the Westminster Choir College and the rest is history. I wow. went there for four straight years, did a rather exceptional job because I could play the violin and that was important there. They had an orchestra of rather com competent uh, ability. Uh, I was able to be a, a leader in uh, the school. As I graduated, I received the uh, honor of having been the, among the graduating class, the person that received the uh, honor of being chosen as the best combination of leadership, musicianship, and scholarship. So my wow. experience there was just 100%, and I had wonderful violin teachers there. Their problem was they were having to teach me what I had done, learned incorrectly, <laughs> and it's very hard to change, especially as an adult. Mm. But at any rate, I did the best I could, and I loved every minute of it. And uh, from there, as I was about to graduate, it so happened that one of the assistant pastors at First Baptist Church, where I was a member, 
was married to a young lady who was the daughter of a pastor of a church in Birmingham, Alabama, who wanted worse than anything to have a graded choir program. So he came to our director, uh, I'll mention the, our director's name was Ray Smathers, and he was exceptional. So he came to Ray and says, I, what do I need to do to get a, a choir, uh, get a director to come to my church and build the kind of a program you have? <laughs> Ray smiled and says, well, if you can wait until uh, May of this year, one of the best suggestions I could have for you is about to graduate. And I would suggest above all that you contact him, speaking of me. Mm -hmm. And he did. And I had an interview there and it was a very happy and successful interview. I had one or two other job offers. Actually, one of, one of them was going to pay me more. But I knew in my heart of hearts that that, that is where I needed to go. And I went to the Ruhama Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. And I served there uh, for three and a half years. But to start with, uh, the church was right almost next door, just a very short uh, block separating the church from what was then Howard College. Howard College was a very well known Baptist school in Alabama. And uh, of course, the college department in the in church in our church was huge because of most of the people that came to the college to, to uh, study probably probably were Baptists, and all of them came to our church to belong. You know, during the school year. Well, the lady that I ultimately married was a teacher in the education department at Howard. She taught elementary education and. Uh, I was superintendent of the college department in, church, in, in Ruhema. And uh, we got to know each other and the rest is history. When did you get married? We married about a year and a half after I went there. I'd met her and there was never any doubt. Yeah. And uh, we, we were together there until I was called to come to the Second Ponce de Lynn Baptist Church in Atlanta which was really quite a, a step up. They had had nothing more than a double quartet as music. They, they had a, a person who was a fine keyboardist and had taught herself as much as she could to play the organ. And she was not about to give up that double quartet for any volunteer choir in this world. And uh, the pastor was very much like my pastor friend in, at Ruhema, he wanted a, 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 a graded choir program. And he'd also gone to Ray Smathers at First Baptist and ask his opinion. And Ray again suggested he call and talk to me at Ruhema. <laughs> and that all resulted, resulted in my going to Second Ponce de Lynn. Hmm. He had called my pastor there who said, I would not hold him back for anything in the world. It'll be a real step up for him to go to your church if he will, if he chooses to do it. And I did, and I was there for 15 and a half years. I, fought, I, I developed a huge graded choir program. Mm -hmm. I uh, was able to, with my string background, I felt no problems whatever in working with professional musicians. And we'd do major oratorios and cantatas and, and uh, things that most churches weren't doing at all. And uh, the church would support the cost of them. We'd, they would support the cost of having them come and play one rehearsal with me and play the performance. And I learned early on that if I'm going to have a successful concert here, I'm going to need to have that choir absolutely ready. And we, we will have one hour, two hours of rehearsal with the orchestra including in that time of 10 or 15 minute break in between. And if they aren't ready to sing uh, a concert in good fashion from that one rehearsal, we, we're not going to be able to do it at all. So I always geared that rehearsal to be for the choir at, at Second Postal End to be absolutely ready to go. And they were. And we had great concerts. We'd do a major work in 
it, it, around uh, around it, during Lent. In fact, it was always on the uh, one of the major Sundays in Lent that we would perform. We would do a major concert in December, and maybe something in between. That I hired members of the Atlanta Symphony to do this, and worked with them all had at the time of my life. And uh, from there, I went upon the leaving, upon the departure of the minister I'd been working with. Uh, the man that came to take his place did not want the kind of music I was doing. He just simply didn't want that much uh, more classical type music. So I found an opportunity to go to the Abington Presbyterian Church in Abington, Pennsylvania, who it was uh, the ideal place for me to go because uh, they wanted what I had, what I could give them. And I spent 20 years there and in the process employed on, for Single unit, a single performance activities, oftentimes member of the members of the Philadelphia Orchestra, like I'd done the Atlanta Symphony players at Second Postal Inn. So, do you ever feel guilty for taking money for doing what you enjoy so much? I surely did. <laughs> I was privileged to do my hobby as my profession, yes. my hobby and my calling in life as my profession. Few people have that. I know, I, I feel, I, I wish for everybody the pleasure I had. I never went to work uh, re dreading the day's work <laughs> at all. <laughs> uh. I retired from that church on, on my 20th anniversary there. I went there the 1st of, fe first of September 19, uh, 1970, and I retired 1st of September 1990. And I've been back here in Atlanta since that time, 25 plus years. And it's been a joyous time. And you've heard just about everything I've got to tell. But no, I'm going to go back on one thing. Part of my military experience uh, involved potentially being a spearhead attack across the Rhine River, right about Cologne. And the approach was to the river was flat and easy to do, but so was it so was it for the Germans on the other side. And that would not have been on the scale of a, attack at a, a, a D-Day, mm -hmm. but it would have been just as bloody. And what saved us on that was the fact that some young American lieutenant and a squad of men discovered that down in Ramajan, Germany, yep. Yep. was it, there was a bridge that had not been blown up yet. And so he and his squad surprised the Germans so that they were able to get on that bridge, kick all of the explosives off into the river, uh, and secure that bridge. And the minute they did that, they called back to headquarters. Eisenhower got the word. He says, send everything we've got to remind you. <laughs> and of course, they were able to get Ponton bridges built across that river at that point because once the Germans realized we had that br that bridge, they started shelling it, but it was too late. We had Ponton bridges across the river that would carry tanks, all kinds of armor, and so we crossed the Rhine at Ramajan, and it saved an awful lot of bloodshed. I think, and I'm sure I'm alive today because later. I didn't have to do it the right the way we had planned to do <laughs> yeah. it. The other, the other one time that I'm alive only because it, of what happened, we were being shelled while we were in combat with Germans. And they, had, they really had us zeroed in. One of, the, uh, one of the other gun emplacements was blown clear apart. Our, uh, our gun emplacement was being shelled, but the shell that came in landed right next to me, did not go off. Hmm. And I think I know why. It was a dud that had been made a dud by the fact that the Germans had solicited French and Polish civilians to work in their munitions factories. And they were clever enough in some instances that they knew how to either leave a part of the shell out or put it in backwards 
or some such thing yeah. that would cause the shell not to explode. It would be inert. Hmm. And that's the kind of shell that hit the ground. If I had had my arm sticking out, I have no doubt it would have knocked my arm off. Wow. It was that close to me. Had it exploded, they couldn't have found my dog tags. Yeah. So, wow. when I get to heaven, I want to meet the German or Polish, not German, French or Polish civilian who doctored that shell because they gave me the rest of my life. Yeah. Wow, that's quite so a So that's a, a, a P.S. to the military experience that I should have remembered to tell you before I got off on all of the post experience. Well, that's a pr pretty dramatic wrap up, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's my story. And uh, if it means anything to anybody else, good. <laughs> well, I think there will be people that will be listening to this uh, in the Library of Congress uh, down at the Atlanta History Center. And I know Sue and I certainly enjoyed listening to you. Uh, this is well. It's been a story. it's been a pleasure to do it and to meet each of you. I think what you're doing is remarkable. And. Uh, it reminds me of what Eisenhower said when he toured all of the uh, uh, concentration camps. Take every picture you can because some idiot is going to say it didn't happen if we don't have every pictorial proof that it did. I won't, con I won't quote exactly what he said, but he, he really made it clear. And uh, they did that. And believe it or not, there are still people that say it didn't happen. Yep. If That's I ever right. meet up with one of them, I'm going to stare him down. And, <laughs> Tell him he doesn't know a thing about what he's talking about. Did you see any of the camps yourself, sir? I'm sorry? Did you see any of the camps yourself? Yeah, we you did. did. We didn't invade any of them because we no. got there just as, as we approached, just after uh, the first troops had invaded them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, terrible times. One story about one of the, one of the soldiers that uh, liberated a camp he walked in and there were these emaciated prisoners that were just standing there looking at him. And he walked up to one of them and hugged him. And before he knew it, there was a line, as far as could see, people waiting to get the hug. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's a remarkable story. Wow. And, and I'm sure it happened in more instances than that, because yeah. the American troops that liberated them were not only astounded at the fact that these people are still able to walk and still able to breathe. And uh, they wanted to give, and it was unfortunate, sometimes they gave some of these people more food than they could take and it killed them. They yeah. were so hungry. They ate and, and the food, they couldn't handle it. They realized early on, you've got to be very careful about what you, how you, how you acknowledge their hunger. Quite a story, sir. Yeah, it is. And I'm going to stop now because well, I've taken your time. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> well, at any rate, it's been a pleasure. Well, what you did was remarkable. And well, we're so grateful that you're willing to share your story well, with us. Well, I'm happy to share it. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I get emotional when I share it. All veterans do, mm -hmm. almost without really, exception. Really, I'm Mr. not surprised. Yeah. Yep. But when I relive it, it all comes back to me so vividly. Well, sir, we thank you for your time, for your memories, for your thoughts, and for this contribution to the History Project. Well, you are more than welcome. You have a CD over there that I've written uh, primarily for my two daughters. Mm -hmm. It's called The Story of My Life. And it starts the day with my having been born in 1924 and ends uh, at this point. Yep. So you're welcome to take that if it's going to be of any advantage to anything to add to the uh, video that we've made. We will absolutely mm -hmm. do that. Well, yes, sir. And by all you. means. Thank you. And yes. thank you for your service. Oh, my, my pleasure. I'm glad I did it. And I would dare not ever want to have to do it again. <laughs> wouldn't take anything for the experience and you couldn't buy uh, me to do it anymore. You've, you've turned the camera off, I think, haven't you? 
we just did.